are coming to you live from Nairobi, Kenya. Welcome to Africa Focus, where we bring you news from across the continent right here on Switch TV Kenya. My name is Joel Church and our sign language interpreter is Tracy Dorcas. Talk to us via social media platforms at Switch TV Kenya, Joel Church M on Twitter, as well on Facebook, Switch TV Kenya and Joel Church. Send in an SMS via triple one triple four triple one. But first, here are stories making headlines. Fighting continues in Tigray region in Ethiopia, according to residents. A controversial shark net system to protect bathers from shark in South Africa has prompted criticism from environmentalists. A sharp increase in teen pregnancies and child marriages has been reported in Zimbabwe during the COVID-19 lockdown. Well, thousands demonstrated in Algiers rejecting early legislative elections announced the day before as weekly rallies by the resurgent Hirak pro-democracy movement gained momentum. Protesters defied a coronavirus-related ban on gatherings to rally from different parts of the capital converging on the central post office at the Hirak movement's emblematic rallying point. Thousands demonstrate in Algiers, rejecting early legislative elections announced a day before as weekly rallies by the resurgent Iraq pro-democracy movement gained momentum. Protesters defied a coronavirus-related ban on gatherings to rally from different parts of the capital, converging on the central post office, the Iraq movement's emblematic rallying point. Demonstrators shouted slogans including, no elections with mafia gangs and a civil, not a military state, a key Hirak slogan. I did not vote on December 12th as long as this power is still in place, as long as the people are still victims of injustice, as long as the people have not realized their dream of state of laws, I will never vote. Until your systems fall, until you all leave, we will continue to militate. The free Algerian people will continue peacefully until the system leaves. President Abdel Majid Taboon issued a decree setting June 12th for early legislative elections after dissolving parliament last month. The Iraq movement broke out in February 2019 in outrage at then President Abdelaziz Bouteflika's bid for fifth term in office. The ailing strongman was forced to step down weeks later, but the movement continued the demonstrations, demanding a sweeping overhaul of a ruling system in place since Algeria's independence from France in 1962. People also took to the streets in other parts of the country, including northwestern Iran, central Tizi Ozu, and eastern Annaba. The prisoners' rights group said protesters had been arrested in Tizi Ozu without providing further details. Once a premier under Bouteflika and elected in a widely boycotted presidential poll in December 2019, Taboon has switched out the protest movement while also seeking to neutralize it. In a gesture of appeasement last month, he announced pardons for dozens of jailed pro-democracy activists, including several prominent figures. Taboon has pledged that the June elections will be free of corruption and will open the doors of parliament to young people. A constitutional referendum in November saw record low participation. Away from that, the destruction from shelling and looting is clear in the town of Ukro in Ethiopia's Tigray region. Our families refute claims by Nobe Peace Laureate Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed that the war is over, describing killings and abuse of their loved ones. <laughs> That would be a joke to me, that would be a joke, because we are consta constantly uh, receiving patients who are injured uh, by the war. They are all civilians. We are, they are all civilians. And the war is escalating. Now it is focused on the civilians. Our young ladies are being raped and 15-year-old children are raped. You can only speak and testify if something is true or false when you see it. Who came to see what's happening here? The media says the war has stopped and peace is restored, but there has been no peace up to now. 
They need to go. Why do they stay here? We have lost peace and can't move freely. We are being killed by Eritrean soldiers and the Northern Command military. They shouldn't stay here even for a single night. This is our home. It's where we live. Otherwise, we will leave. Moving on, a sharp increase in teenage pregnancies and child marriages has been reported in Zimbabwe during the COVID-19 lockdown with at least 4,959 girls falling pregnant and 1,174 cases of child marriages being recorded between January and February 5th this year. Our reporter Harry Chimea files the report. A prolonged lockdown due to the pandemic has seen children going for months without attending school excavating the complex factors that drive teen pregnancies and early marriages. Schools in Zimbabwe spent the greater part of last year closed following the outbreak of COVID-19. After abruptly closing in March last year, schools only reopened in a phased manner, starting with examination classes in September, followed by this year's examination classes in October and the rest of learners in November. In the worrying report, Women Affairs Minister Sitembi Sonyoni said social vices such as child marriages were on increase, revealing that a total of 4,959 got impregnated in such a short period. This means that nearly 5,000 of the girls risk losing the educational opportunity, adding that most worrying is the 1,774 who were in matrimonial union before their 18th birthday. In Zimbabwe, many girls drop out of school as a result of pregnancies and also due to increased poverty cycles. Despite various government intervention programs and legislation that prohibit child marriages, the practice is still common in rural areas and poor urban areas. The government has also adopted a raft of measures to keep girls from disadvantaged backgrounds in school. Last year, Zimbabwe amended the country's Education Act by making it illegal to expel pregnant girls from school. Reporting for Switch TV, my name is Harriet Chimea. Elsewhere, Chad President Idris Adebi kicked off his campaign for a sixth term, a calling for unity after rival protests were banned and broken up. The first rally since the start of the official election period was held by Debi's patriotic salvation movement at a parked stadium in the capital, N'Djamena. Debbie, who has ruled for 30 years and is widely deemed a shoe in for another term, said he had fought for national unity while also drawing a line in the sand for his opponents. On Thursday, three opposition candidates quit the race ahead of the April 11 ballot, with one of them, Mohamed Yasko Brahim, saying the climate was not favorable for fair and transparent presidential elections. Their withdrawal leaves half a dozen candidates, including Debbie, who has ruled the country since 1990. In recent months, Demonstrations calling for his resignation have been banned and violently dispersed. Another authorized candidate to withdraw on Thursday, Sully Kebzerbo, denounced what he called the clear militarization of the political climate after police and troops raided the home of another opposition figure, Yaya Dilo Jero. His mother and two sisters died in the clash, according to the government, though Yaya Dilo's party says five family members died. Eadilo has fled and his candidacy was later rejected by the Supreme Court. Lincoln Umbogo, Switch TV News. Our focus now in South Africa, the province, uh, the province of KwaZulu Natal, is one of the main destinations for seaside tourism. To safeguard these, authorities have implemented a controversial shark net system to protect bathers from sharks, but which has also prompted criticism from environmentalists. A final breath of fresh air before dropping into the Indian Ocean. It's time to dive with the sharks. Black tip sharks are common along the Aliwan Shoal, a marine protected area off the east coast of South Africa. For some in this group, this is their first encounter with sharks. For me, this was such an incredible experience. Um, they're really majestic animals underwater, and to just dive with them and see them in their natural habitat is amazing. Safe shark diving is Gary Snowgrass' specialty, but for several years, this dive center owner has seen the number and diversity of animals decrease. Some of the larger predators have almost completely disappeared. We used to call it a tiger shark dive. We've had to change the name because we can't call it a tiger shark dive anymore because we can't, you know, there's, they, 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 we're seeing them so seldom. Um, so over the last couple of years, it, it sadly has 
they've decreased in numbers dramatically, dramatically. What will be the reason for that? Um, <laughs> shock nets, <laughs> the, uh, the drum lines probably. Shock nets lie only a few hundred meters from the shore, 212 meters long and 6 meters wide. Walter Banadis is one of the pioneers of shock diving in the region. We've seen loads of dead sharks that have been caught in the nets. Turtles, dolphins, we've had whale sharks caught in these nets. This system doesn't keep sharks away from the beaches. They can simply pass below and around the nets. They have more final goal, to catch the sharks. They're basically uh, curtains of death. They're a passive system that's been put in the water and uh, anything that puts its head in that net dies. That's a, how a gill net works. The device dates to the late 1950s when a series of fatal attacks caused panic among the birthers in the area. Today, the province shark board manages more than 37 beaches along 300 kilometers of coastline. There have been no lethal attacks since the nets were installed decades ago, but the system has come under fire for its impact on other species. In an attempt to reduce the bycatch of the harmless animals, over the last 15 years, we've reduced about 15 kilometers of nets and replaced them with 177 drum lines. Those are simply baited hooks suspended below a drum. The use of drum lines might be more targeted but is equally deadly. According to official figures, at least 400 sharks are killed in South Africa each year, including about 50 from protected species such as great whites and hammerheads. Killing sharks to protect bathers is outdated thinking, says John Harris, who heads marine conservation group named Wild Oceans. By having them there and knowing that they actually don't prevent large sharks coming to the swimming beaches is giving people a false security, but it's also it's signaling to people that sharks are dangerous and we must protect them. Whereas in actual fact, we've got to change people's minds. But the nets won't disappear anytime soon, especially since the province attracts more than 6 million visitors each year. Despite their reputation, sharks play a pivotal role in the food chain and in the ocean's biodiversity. But faced with economic reality, sharks are unlikely to shed the image of villain in the sea. David Kagina, Switch TV. Well, time to take a breather. Stay with us here on Africa Focus. Still to come. Several African countries roll out vaccination exercise as the World Health Organization says countries should continue using the AstraZeneca vaccine for now. Welcome back to Africa Focus. My name is Joel Church and our sign language interpreter is Tracy Dorcas. Moving on, fishermen on the Kenyan side near the border with Somalia demonstrated with their doors in the ocean as the UN's International Court of Justice hears a border dispute case between the two countries. The UN's top court allowed Somalia's case to go ahead in a long-run maritime dispute with Kenya on Monday, saying that it regretted Nairobi's refusal to attend. Kenya announced earlier that it would snub this week's International Court of Justice hearing after the Hague-based court refused to allow further delays in the case. Somalia has asked the ICJ to rule in the dispute, potentially decided control of a large Indian Ocean zone that is rich in fish and which might contain substantial crude oil reserves. Somalia criticizes Kenyan's defiance of the ICJ, which was set up after the World War II to rule in dispute between the UN member states. We always get fish very cheap from Kiunga. The price is low because there is plenty of fish from that side of Kiunga. We are able to sell and make money and like buying fish from here where it is scarce. So buying fish from Kiunga is better. You are able to sell and make money, so we are able to empower ourselves. But here in Lamu, the problem is we don't have plenty of fish like there. So Kiunga is better, especially when the border is open, our business will benefit. The 
The ICJ is hearing a case brought by Somalia in 2014. Even as Somalia, which lies northeast of Kenya, wants to extend its maritime frontier with Kenya along the line of the land border in a southeastern direction. Kenya wants the border to head out to the sea in a straight line east, giving it more territory. The disputed triangle of water stretches over an area of more than 100,000 square kilometers, equivalent to 40,000 square miles. Kenyan prosecutor Kihara Kariuki had earlier said in a letter that his country will not be participating because of COVID-19 pandemic. It is not too late for the both countries, Somalia and Kenya, to explore other obvious channels, including IGAD, the African Union, or even our elders who have settled such differences for centuries. The people of Lamu and our brothers in Somalia have coexisted for centuries and continue to consider the current boundaries simply as colonial lines drawn neither to the interest of the interest of the Kenyan or Somalia people. In its letter, Kenya also argued that holding the ICJ hearing virtually did not allow it to present its case in the most effective way. The ICJ on Monday, however, dismissed Kenya's request for a 30-minute opportunity to orally address the court before the commencement of the actual hearing. I can say if we are losing fishing, we can say we are losing 50% of our livelihood because normally our community in Lamu East it is not educated. So and Lamu County we have no any industry to be invested. So if we are losing the fishing ground, we are totally losing our 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 life. Kenya recalled its ambassadors to Somalia in February 2019 after accusing Somalia of selling oil and gas blocks at a London auction despite the pending delineation case before the ICJ. Kenya also contested for the ICJ authority to rule in the case, but the court dismissed his objections in 2017. Robert Omar, Switch TV News. Our focus now on the COVID-19 pandemic and we begin in Ethiopia where it's giving out its first coronavirus vaccine doses as health ministry warns of an alarming increase in cases. Africa's second most populous country last week received 2.2 million doses of the AstraZeneca jab manufactured by the Serum Institute of India and is targeting health workers during the first phase of its vaccine drive. Some of the first shots were administered at Eka Kotebe General Hospital in the capital Addis Ababa. Officials have also organized kickoff events in six other regions including Tigray where the Ethiopian military is battling forces aligned with the recently ousted regional ruling party. According to the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, COVID-19 cases in Ethiopia have over the past month risen by 11% on average each week. In one way, we are happy that we are being vaccinated today. On the other hand, uh, the vaccine which is available in Ethiopia is not enough for the whole community. Uh, so uh, our community has to wait for some time. So it means the, pa the pandemic is not yet over. We're going to have uh, patients coming to our hospital, maybe for the next six months or so. I am delighted because we interact with the patients 100%. I was waiting for the patients to help us protect ourselves. I'm delighted because we interact with the patients 100%. I was waiting for the patients the virus is spreading recently in a worrying way. It has reached an alarming stage. Despite this, the negligence of our society has also increased. We are going backward in terms of following the basic precautions. <laughs> Meanwhile, Sierra Leone's President Julius Madabio and top government officials received first Sinopharm vaccine doses against COVID-19 at the State House in the capital of Freetown. Sierra Leone is set to receive 200,000 doses of the Chinese-made coronavirus vaccine Sinopharm, although the West African nation's official's infection rate is far below that of the West. Having recorded 3,880 cases since March and 79 deaths about the country is nonetheless in the middle of a second wave of COVID-19 infections which forced the government to impose a nationwide curfew last month. At this stage, it is a milestone 
that's been trying to fight off COVID using measures, but now we have a vaccine. And thanks be to the People's Republic of China and the COVAX facility, we have two sets of vaccines here that are quite safe. I think I can safely say that we have fought a very good fight. Elsewhere, Somalia received its first shipment of 300,000 doses of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine uh, destined for frontline workers and those most at risk from COVID-19. The conflict-torn nation has seen coronavirus cases so 77% over the past month to 9,190, while deaths have more than doubled to a total of 367. It has been a tough time for the last three months. Every night we were having meetings with UNICEF, WHO. It was a task force who were taking care of every particular on how the vaccine can arrive in our country and the rollout. It's dedicated particularly to frontline workers and those in most urgent need, but it is only the first of future batches that will address other vaccine demands for Somalia. We encourage people to take the vaccine. We encourage people to continue with all possible preventive measures, hand washing, mask wearing, social distancing. Tunisia launched its coronavirus vaccination campaign a month later than planned with health professionals first in line. Around 300 nurses, doctors and other health personnel uh, who are heavily exposed to the virus received shots during the morning at uh, El Menza vaccination center in the capital Tunis. The country received 30,000 doses of Russia's Sputnik V vaccine on March 9th. This initial delivery is being used to vaccinate 15,000 health professionals and a further 94,000 vaccines. This time provided by Pfizer-BioNTech are due to arrive from next week, while jobs produced by AstraZeneca are also to arrive soon. This is a milestone. We have just passed an important milestone in the fight against the pandemic, an important milestone that can make us see the end of the tunnel. The teams are exhausted, the people are exhausted, and there is hope to live a normal life again, to live a normal economy again. On in 2009, the day we received the first batch of H1N1 vaccine, I was the first in the Republic to be vaccinated. So 11 years later, I am the first again. I have total confidence in the Tunisian medical system. It is certain that we will be less stressed. We will be less afraid when we approach a patient who has COVID-19. Just like when you get a flu shot and you approach someone who has the flu. So even if you catch it, it'll be much less likely to have severe symptoms. If we want to get back to living a life on the age of normal, we will have to eradicate this virus, and you cannot do it without vaccination. This is a fact, and it is a reality that should not be denied. So we have to go and get vaccinated if we want to resume our activity, if we want to live normally, because living like this is also stressful. The World Health Organization says countries should continue using the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccination for now, adding that so far there hasn't been found a link between these events and the vaccine. Several countries have reported feared links between the vaccine and blood clots despite repeated assurances of its safety. Since our last press conference on Friday, several more countries have su suspended the use of AstraZeneca vaccines as a precautionary measure after reports of blood clots in people who had received the vaccine from two batches produced in Europe. This does not necessarily mean these events are linked to vaccination. The question really is the linkage with the vaccine, and this is why we need to look at all of the data. The experts are looking at the data, and so far we do not find an association between these events and the vaccine because the rates at which these events have occurred in the vaccinated group are in fact less than what you would expect in the general population at the same time. So the recommendation 
it is, this point is that the risk benefit of not vaccinating using AstraZeneca vaccines and other vaccines outweigh the risk of the COVID infection, which we know has a, a significant impact on on people with severe disease, hospitalization, and death. Well, that's all here on Africa Focus today. But keep the conversation going on our social media platforms. Our Sweet TV Kenya, Joel Chacha M on Twitter as well on Facebook. Sweet TV Kenya and Joel Chacha. My director has been uh, Julie. Producer Harry Chimea. And my name is Joel Chacha and our sign language interpreter is Tracy Dolkas. Until next time, do have yourself a great day.